Hello, I'm Craig Barton and welcome to this Tips for Teachers video. Now, one of the key takeaways from the research into cognitive load theory is that where possible, as teachers, we should try to avoid what's known as the split attention effect. Now, if you're not aware of what the split attention effect is, just have a read of that sentence on the left. Now, for me, the key to the split attention effect is avoiding this switch, this switch between different sources of information. Every time a student needs to do a switch, it has a cognitive cost. It takes up attention in working memory. Now, it turns out that the way I was doing worked examples for about probably 12 years or so, it was almost as if I was trying to split as much attention as I could with my students, which is not ideal. So let's imagine you're my kids and I'm trying to teach you the wonders of uh, prime factorization. So I'm going to teach you how to write 24 as a product of prime factors. So what I would do is I would be at the board doing some writing. So there's something that you need to watch and also read. At the same time, I'd be talking. I'd be offering verbal explanations and asking questions. And if that wasn't enough, <laughs> at the same time, I'd be expecting you to copy the worked example down. Was it any wonder that my students didn't take it in? Or worse than that, they seemed to take it in at the time because it's all very easy to kind of nod along, frantically scribble things down, yeah, 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 and almost convince yourself you're understanding it. But then everything falls apart whenever you then have to do some independent practice. So I've now got a three-stage process that I do for all my worked examples. So first, I model the process in silence. I then try to prompt self-explanation in my students. And finally, my students copy it down, or maybe they copy it down. So let's have a look at this in action. Let's start with this model in silence. Now, there's a real danger that when we model something in silence, it can be a very passive experience for our students. They just watch something unfold in front of them. So I don't want that to happen. I want my students thinking hard at all stages. So I give my students a challenge. I say that whilst I'm doing my silent modeling, I'm going to pause at key points. So when I pause, I want you to ask yourself, what's he just done? Why has he done it? And what do I think he's going to do next? And they don't have to write this down. They don't have to tell anybody. It's just for them to be thinking in their heads. And this prompts this self-explanation that's going to be then followed up in the second part of this process. So I'll just show you what I mean. Um, I can't do this as effectively as I would be able to do in the classroom, but hopefully you'll get a sense of it. Um, you may be familiar. This is how I set out my board when I'm doing worked examples. A worked example column on the left, a thinking column, which we're going to fill in in a moment in the middle, and then the your turn on the right. So in silence, I'd go through something like this. And I pause here. So my challenge for students is, what's he just done there? Why has he written that six? What do I think he's going to do next? And then I do it. Pause again. What's he just done? Why has he done it? What's he going to do next? Pause. Pause. And then finally, pause. Sorted. Now, once I've gone through that model in silence, I then move on to the second part, which, which is where I want to prompt self-explanation. This is where I would ask the kind of questions that normally I would have bundled together with my silent model. So things like this. What pair of numbers can we choose for that first row? Was it just six and four? What's special about six and four? Could we have chosen some other numbers? Which type of numbers do we circle? And what order do we write our final answer? Now, those questions, again, it's up to you as a teacher how you choose to get your students to respond. Um, what I've experimented with is, is reading out the question and having it there on the board, giving my students time to think silently, and then explaining the answer myself. But of course, what I could also do is they could write their answers down on mini whiteboards and hold them up, or they could discuss their answer with their partner, 
or we can have a whole class discussion, whatever works with you. But the idea here is that we are now prompting thought. We're prompting the students to reflect on what they've just seen, but we're not bundling it together. They're not having to watch and reflect at the same time. And what you can also do is you can break it up. And this works particularly well for longer examples. So you might choose to do something like this. Start with the 24, split it like that, and then pause and give that self-explanation prompt. And then once you've dealt with that self-explanation prompt, move on to the next stage and then give the second one. So you can break it up that way. But I really like the idea of presenting something in silence, even if it's for a short period of time, before then we verbalize and ask the question. So students get a chance to really focus watching and then they can do the talking, listening and so on and so forth. And then we get to this bit, copy it down. Now, I never even considered this for probably about 15 years. Of course, you copy it down. That's how students learn. But do they learn from copying things down? Is there value in them then copying this worked example down? I'm not so sure. I'll, I'll give you the argument why it might not be that good an idea. So first, we, we get books that, that look like this and it looks beautiful. But I've got two questions about this. One, how long does that take? How much class time is that taking up? And two, do kids use their books to revise? Because that's often the argument given, right? You copy down a worked example so the kids can use the books to revise. How many kids do that? And are the books the best way to revise maths? We know the best way to do maths is to, is to learn maths and remember maths is to practice doing maths. I'm, I'm not convinced that many students learn from their books or the book's the best medium to do it. <laughs> and of course, you get things like this. The kids who are so slow writing their example down that they never get around to actually finishing it. And that's a bit of a waste of time. And then you also get things like this. This is my favorite example. So this was a worked example on pie charts. Uh, the teacher asked the students to copy that down. And this was the result, some kind of deformed egg, which um, isn't accurate at all. And you don't really want the kids revising from that. So I'm not so sure anymore. And one of the best things I've seen if teachers do get kids to copy things down is they copy down the worked example. But then what they ask the students to do is to annotate round the worked example, their answers to their, their thinking prompts. And that way, the copying down is a bit more of an active process. It's not just blindly copying things down. It's copying things down, but then thinking. So why did we choose the six and four? Could we have chosen some other numbers? Why do we circle our answers? So copying down the worked example and annotating it with answers to thinking prompts, I think works quite well but I'll leave that for you to decide. So that's my worked example process and now, and that I used to kind of bundle those three together, but now I separate them. What do you think about that? Um, might you give that a go? Is that similar or different to your worked example process? If you found that useful, I'd be so grateful if you could like the video and subscribe to the Tips for Teachers YouTube channel and visit tipsforteachers.co.uk for more tips like this. Thanks so much for watching.